Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Institute. I'd like to uh, welcome our speaker this afternoon, Amanda Slot. She's Robert Bosch, Senior Fellow at the Centre on the United States in, European, uh, in Europe at the Brookings Institute in Washington, and her research focuses on Turkey and Southern Europe, UK politics, EU foreign policy, and transatlantic relations. So it's a, quite a wide uh, selection, but she's going to focus today on uh, the subject of entangled alliances, the United States, Turkey, and the Syrian Kurds. Uh, she's also a non-resident fellow at the Ash Centre at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She has considerable government experience. She served in the US government for almost a decade, most recently as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Southern Europe and Eastern Mediterranean Affairs at the State Department. So she will be able to enlighten us at least on when policy seems to be made fairly conventionally. I would be interested in her opinion now that policy is made in other ways by the new administration. She's no stranger to this part of the world. She has a doctorate in politics in the University of Edinburgh uh, and a BA in political theory from James Madison College at Mich in Michigan State University. But she also did a postdoc in Queens and Belfast and has lived in Belfast for three years. So she knows the place, at least she knows part of this island. And uh, Amanda, I'd like to welcome you. Um, basically, Amanda will speak to us for uh, 20, 25 minutes if she chooses to speak that long. Then we will have an off the record uh, uh, session, uh, Q and A session under Chatham House rules, which uh, I've forgotten the actual text of them, but basically uh, you may uh, refer to what you hear, but you may not attribute it and, or quote it directly or the, the venue. Uh, I, I, um, I, I the other kind of household um, comment, you know where the emergency exits are. And also, please turn off your mobile phones. I better make sure I've done that myself, <laughs> which I haven't. OK, Amanda, thank you very much for coming. And I'd like to ask you to speak to us, please. Great. I thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure to, to be back. I, uh, was familiar with the Institute from, from years ago when I was doing a, a PhD uh, on looking at the setting up of the Scottish Parliament and its relationship with the European Union. Uh, so I'm actually over here to be doing some, some Brexit-related research. So we'll be off to London and then back up to, to Edinburgh and Belfast. So my, my first love really is uh, uh, British, Irish, and, and European politics. But, but for my sins, I was managing Turkey for several years in, in government. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be talking about US-Turkey relations now and, and also the the, the future of, of where we seem to be heading in, in Syria. Uh, Turkey certainly sits in a very turbulent neighborhood and has been profoundly affected by both the civil war and the fight against the Islamic State in Syria. Uh, these conflicts have flooded Turkey with over three and a half million refugees, uh, for which I think Turkey has not tended to get sufficient credit for, for dealing with them as, as well as they have. Uh, it's complicated relations with Russia and Iran contributed to terrorist attacks on Turkish soil and has also inflamed the Kurdish issue. In terms of the way the U.S. and, and Turkey have approached Syria, uh, there's been different priorities, which really has contributed to tensions within our bilateral relationship. Turkey initially focused on the removal of President uh, Bashar al-Assad from power. Uh, so if you remember back over seven years ago when this conflict started, it was initially a, a small uprising within Syria that started with some schoolboys painting graffiti on a wall. Uh, and it was happening within the wider context of the Arab Spring, uh, which I think is what led to Obama's enthusiastic comments that, that Assad must go. And so Erdogan's initial approach was to try and engage with Assad and see if he could persuade him to make some small democratic reforms that would sufficiently assuage the, the protesters so that things didn't become a larger conflict. Uh, Assad refused to do that, and from Erdogan's perspective, once you turn down Erdogan, you are essentially dead to him. And so Erdogan's perspective at that point also became Assad must go. And so in furtherance of the objective of Assad leaving, he was willing to turn a blind eye to some of the more nefarious characters that were crossing the Turkish border and going to join the opposition to Assad within Syria. 
Uh, the Obama administration was very reluctant to get involved in the civil war, but became involved militarily once the Islamic State uh, emerged and was seen to be threatening the national security, both of the United States, uh, Europe, and our regional partners. Uh, Turkey initially felt much less threatened by the Islamic State, and so it refrained from acting against the group and tended to turn another blind eye to some of the activity that was happening within its borders. That view changed after there was an attack by a suicide bomber that was alleged to have ISIS links in July 2015. And weeks after that, Turkey opened its air base in Injerlik in the southwest of the country to U.S. and coalition forces. Uh, Turkey's own flying as part of that coalition was short-lived as it soon shot down a Russian jet that had re repeatedly violated its, uh, its airspace on its, its border. Uh, it's certainly arguable that Turkey's much more aggressive posture also increased its vulnerability to retaliation by the Islamic State uh, as Ankara was attacked in October 2015 and Istanbul twice in 2016. Uh, I would tangentially say I think we've also tended to have some double standards here with Turkey uh, in that you will recall there has never been a je suis Istanbul moment uh, the same way that we have had for Nice and for Paris and for other cities in Western Europe that have fallen prey to, to attacks by the Islamic State. The second major area of disagreement then between the United States and Turkey was how to respond to the Islamic State. Uh, there was negotiations for months between the, the U.S. and Turkey about possible joint military action uh, that I was involved in at the time, which ultimately ended up faltering over a couple of points. First, Erdogan was very keen to have a no-fly zone along his southern border with Syria. Uh, he was quite interested in, in what he called a back-to-Syria policy, which meant everybody go back to Syria. Uh, the opposition go back, the refugees go back, and, and it was a way of, of trying to, to clean out some of these people that were, were flooding um, Turkey. Uh, he was also quite interested in trying to block the Kurds from, from doing anything along the, the Turkish-Syrian border, which, which I'll come back to. Uh, but there was also disagreement about the availability of local Syrian forces to partner with and also the affiliation of these forces, uh, because the United States and Turkey have had to have some differences of opinion over what actually constitute a, a terrorist organization. Uh, there were some American efforts that you may recall to try and train and equip Syrian forces with whom to, to partner. Uh, that was not a highly successful effort, uh, in part because the U.S. was only willing to train and equip those who were willing to fight against the Islamic State. Not surprisingly, most of these opposition forces who had been fighting for several years, who had lost family, brothers, uh, relatives in the conflict, were not interested in fighting the Islamic State. They wanted to continue their campaign against uh, the regime. So therefore, uh, American special forces who were operating on the ground in Syria needed to find ground forces with whom to partner, and this is when they happened upon the, the Syrian Kurds, the, the YPG. So starting with the airdrop in 2014 to the Kurdish town of Kobani, which really became the starting point of the American fight against the Islamic State in Syria, uh, Kobani notable because it could be uh, seen by, by CNN cameras, I would argue, from, from across the, the Turkish border, the U.S. then started providing logistical and air support to the, the Kurds and continued to ramp up its, its partnership with them. Not surprisingly, Turkey has consistently and quite vehemently objected to U.S. partnership with the YPG because of the links between the YPG and the PKK. Uh, from the U.S. government perspective, the PKK is a designated terrorist organization by the U.S. and the EU. Neither the U.S. nor the EU has designated the YPG, uh, which is what made it legally possible for the United States to, to support the, um, the efforts of the, the YPG. Uh, I would argue this is essentially a distinction without a difference. Uh, while it may have been true in, in legal terms, it certainly didn't account for the practical cooperation between these two groups in terms of the, the, the membership and the, the movement of individuals between both organizations. So at that point, Turkey's top priority in Syria shifted from the overthrow of Assad to preventing the Syrian Kurds from connecting cantons in northern Syria into a single contiguous region. Uh, the Turks believed that this could either resort or result in an independence bid by the Kurds in Syria, uh, which could then inflame a desire for a Kurdish movement or a Kurdish independence bid by their Kurdish population, uh, the majority of which are in the southeast of the country, or that it could be used as a staging area for attacks by the YPG PKK onto Turkey. 
Uh, and Turkish fears of violence by, by Kurdish extremists are not unfounded. Uh, in 2016 alone, far more Turks were killed in attacks by the PKK and its affiliates than by, by ISIS and others. Uh, Syria-related conflict also contributed to the breakdown of Turkey's two-and-a-half-year ceasefire with the, the PKK. Uh, so Erdogan had initiated a peace process with the PKK. Uh, there were some openings that was made to the, the Kurdish side, uh, and the, the PKK did have a, a ceasefire for a, a period of time. So despite all of this negative rhetoric, Erdogan largely tolerated U.S. support for the YPG. Uh, I think he was sufficiently pragmatic to understand that the U.S. was working with the YPG for the objective of countering the Islamic State. However, Erdogan did have two red lines with this cooperation. Uh, first, he opposed any direct arming of the YPG. Uh, so the U.S. military largely addressed this by providing mission-specific supplies to the YPG Syrian Arab partners in the Syrian Democratic Forces. Uh, so the U.S. military worked with the YPG and other partners on the ground to create this umbrella organization, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF. The majority of that was YPG fighters, but then there was also a number of Syrian Arab fighters. And the thinking was that there would be a snowballing effect that Syrian Arabs would see the success of the SDF, more of them would want to join this coalition, and so the size of the, the SDF then would, would grow. Uh, so there had been a practice of, of providing arms to the Syrian partners um, within this, which again you could argue was a, sti a distinction without a difference, but, but that was the, the way the operations were, were done. Uh, this policy ended up changing under Trump at the beginning of the administration, and frankly, I think it would have if Obama had been in, in office for another six to 12 months uh, with the battle for Raqqa. Uh, that was seen as a sufficiently large-scale and complicated effort that there was a desire to give heavier weaponry to the YPG in order to fight that battle in, in Raqqa. Uh, the Obama administration did not take that decision because of the potential for negative repercussions with Turkey, and given that the point at which that would have happened was at the very end of the Obama administration, they decided to hand that over to the Trump administration to make a, a decision on that. Uh, the second was that Erdogan had said that YPG forces should not move west of the Euphrates. So if you think about the map of, of northern Syria, you have the Euphrates essentially down the middle. You have a number of cantons to the eastern side of that, which is where U.S. forces have been based around Kobani uh, and, and other cities. And then on the west of the country is where Afrin is. Uh, the U.S. was not working with the Kurds in Afrin. They were being supported by, by the Russians. Uh, but the U.S. was working with the Kurds that were on the eastern side of that. And then Mambich was right there on, on the Euphrates. So there was a process of negotiation with the Turks and saying to them, again, we need the YPG to lead the campaign into Mambich to clear the city. They will have to cross the Euphrates to do that. Once that operation is done, then they will retreat back to the west and Syrian Arabs will, um, will govern that, that area. Uh, <coughs> Turkey acquiesced and said, okay, uh, the SDF went in, they cleared the city, uh, but the problem is that the YPG did not leave. Uh, so I will come back to that, but that is part of what is, is frustrating uh, Erdogan right now. So this then left a very Gordian knot, uh, given the YPG's presence in, in northern Syria. And it's raised a lot of questions for the United States and the counter-ISIS coalition going forward about what the security and governance arrangements are going to look like in a post-Assad, post-ISIS northern Syria. Uh, there's been a lot of conflict within the administration, uh, and frankly, a lot of these fault lines existed during the Obama administration, but they've become much more heightened during the Trump administration, and we're also seeing a lot of these disagreements spilling out uh, publicly. The State Department has always maintained that cooperation with the YPG is temporary, transactional, and tactical, that it was very limited, it was focused on the counter-ISIS operation, and once ISIS was done, that, that cooperation was going to end. Trump has told Erdogan that the U.S. is going to stop arming the YPG, uh, including in a phone call in November 2017. Uh, in an interesting uh, commentary on the way U.S. politics is working right now, this caught the Defense Department off guard, uh, which quickly ended up issuing a statement clarifying that it was reviewing pending adjustments, which essentially suggests, no, we're not going to stop doing that, but we're not going to overtly say that. Uh, in January, in turn, the Pentagon surprised the White House when the counter-ISIS coalition based in Baghdad announced that it was going to be creating a 30,000-strong border security force with a significant YPG component that would be deployed along the Turkish border. Not surprisingly, the Turks were very upset about this, uh, which then led Secretary Tillerson to come out and say that entire situation has been misportrayed, misdescribed, some people misspoke, we're not creating a border security force at all. <laughs> 
He then, about two days later, delivered a major policy speech at Stanford, setting out the administration's Syria policy, calling for a long-term U.S. military presence in northern Syria to help prevent a resurgence of terrorist violence, uh, prevent the change of regime leadership, help reconstruct liberated areas. He also shifted policy to include countering Iran. So if you're the, the Turks, this still sounds like a long-term American uh, security presence. So a couple of days after that, on January 20, Turkey launched Operation Olive Branch against YPG forces in Syria. Uh, so I think the, the Turks had long been concerned. I think they have been expressing their concerns to the United States, and certainly launching a large-scale military invasion has been a very good way of getting the attention of the U.S. government. Uh, so to come back to my earlier map of where things are in Syria, uh, Turkey has been focusing on the western side in Afrin. Uh, what's interesting about that is those YPG forces have been cooperating with Russia. They are not ones that have been cooperating with the U.S. And second, Russia controls the airspace in that area. So Turkey has needed to get Russian acquiescence to launch a campaign against Russian-backed forces. Uh, and Russia ended up pulling its advisors out that had been working with the, the YPG there. Uh, after the Turks had shot down the Russian military plane in 2015, <coughs> not surprisingly, relations between Turkey and Russia were quite bad. Uh, Russia imposed a lot of, of economic sanctions on Turkey. Uh, Turkey took a significant hit in terms of tourism and, and economics. But then there was a rapprochement when Erdogan wanted to launch his prior military campaign, Operation Euphrates Shield, which again largely served the same purpose of clearing YPG forces off from its border and protect protecting them from connecting these cantons. The significance of protecting the cantons is if they did, you would have a contiguous Kurdish-controlled territory all across northern Syria and all across Turkey's border, which would then block Turkey from having access anywhere into, into Syria. Uh, so Turkey has now been successful in terms of, of capturing uh, Afrin and, and pushing YPG forces out of there. The big question now is whether Turkey ends up moving east towards Manbij, towards the Euphrates, which is about 100 kilometers away, uh, as it has threatened to do. The concern from the perspective of the United States is one, Turkey would then be going after YPG forces that the US itself has backed. Uh, and second, there's also about 2,000 special forces of the United States on the ground. So you could potentially have a conflict between two uh, NATO allies on, on the ground there. Uh, so I would be remiss in, in not mentioning that some of these <clears throat> domestic Kurdish issues uh, that Erdogan is concerned about are not only related to understandable security concerns given links between the YPG and the PKK, uh, but there's also, of course, an element of domestic Kurdish politics for, for Erdogan here, too. Uh, certainly the misstep by the Trump administration compelled Erdogan to address this threat by presenting himself as a strong leader that's capable of defending Turkish security. Uh, so following a, a coup, uh, following perceptions of security threats, it certainly puts Erdogan in a stronger position domestically to be able to look like he's a strong military leader and he's protecting the country from this, this Kurdish threat. Uh, and certainly public opinion polls in Turkey show that there is significant report or support for what Turkey has been, been doing in, in Syria. Uh, there's also, at this time, had been elections coming up. These elections have now been called early. They're going to be June 24th in Turkey. Uh, they're presidential and parliamentary elections, and they also bring into force a lot of the constitutional changes that Turks had voted on in the constitutional referendum last, last spring. So maintaining rhetorical and political pressure on the Syrian Kurds helps to delegitimize the voice of the, the Turkish Kurds. Uh, Long tangents related to that, which I will not fully go into, but there had been parliamentary elections in 2015 where you had a strong showing by the HDP, which was the domestic Kurdish political party. It was the first time they had crossed the 10% threshold to be able to get seats in government and also cost the AKP, Erdogan's party, its governing majority. Uh, Erdogan was not happy with that, so there was a long period of foot dragging during which time he ramped up his military campaign against the PKK, re-ran elections in November of 2015 and got back the governing parliamentary majority uh, and then went on to arrest the co-leaders of the HDP uh, and so the, the co-leader and, and 10 members of, of parliament from the HDP are, are sitting in jail. So lots of, of complicated domestic uh, politics going on there too. So where do we go from here? Uh, my final point will be that this is uh, 
creating complications certainly for the United States because it's very unclear what the United States' policy on Syria is. Uh, it's unclear what U.S. policy is on, on many things at the moment, but, but particularly on, on Syria. Uh, in fairness, I would argue that it was never clear that the Obama administration had a Syria policy. We had a very clear Iraq policy, made easier by the fact that we had a democratically elected government that we could partner with. Uh, we have had a counter-ISIS strategy, uh, which from a military perspective has been effective in terms of, of eliminating the Islamic State. And we are in the, the final phases of that. And so the Turkish military mission is causing a lot of frustration in the Pentagon because these YPG forces that the US have been supporting in Mambij have moved over to Afrin to join their YPB, YPG brethren there who are trying to counter the, uh, the, the Turkish um, assault. Uh, but it's not clear what, what Syria policy is and what U.S. posture is going to be in Syria following the Islamic State. Uh, as I said, the U.S. was not interested in getting involved in the civil war in Syria, and there tend to be lots of questions now about how we actually draw an end to the ongoing civil war in, in Syria. And what makes it so difficult is it's essentially become a proxy fight between lots of multiple different international actors. Uh, you have Russia that has a very active presence. You have Iran that is on the ground. The U.S. is there, and now you also have Turkey there. Oh, and there's the question of what the Syrian people actually want, including large numbers of Syrian Arabs that are now living in areas that the Syrian Kurds control. Uh, so the U.S. then launched military strikes. Uh, the week before, uh, President Trump was saying that he wanted the U.S. to leave. Uh, he initially said he wanted U.S. forces out within 48 hours. Uh, his commanders persuaded him that was simply logistically impossible and also not wise because there were still ongoing efforts to conclude the mission against the Islamic State. So it appears that Trump has at least agreed to allow these forces to be there for the next six months to conclude the, the counter ISIS operation. Uh, it is then an open question as to whether or not the U.S. forces leave. Uh, I think Trump is, is not keen to have them there. I think he doesn't see that as being in the U.S. interest for them to be there and so is, is looking to pull them out. Um, there was then the use of, of chemical weapons. Uh, Trump, I think, caused some international confusion with his very aggressive tweets uh, that were calling out both Assad and, and Putin by name. Uh, there is a school of thought that with all of these separate questions going on about Russian interference in the election, Russian collusion, which Trump has never said anything about, that this has been a way for him to be tough on Russia and Putin uh, in a separate sphere of action, uh, separate from the American domestic political sphere. Uh, so the U.S. did end up going in with British and French forces and did very, very limited retaliatory punitive strikes against the Syrian regime for the use of, of weapons. Uh, the U.S. had done similar strikes a year and a week before under President Trump that targeted an airfield and, and some aircraft. The strikes this time were very narrowly focused on chemical production and storage facilities that were a ways away from any potential conflict with Russian, Iranian, and regime forces there because it was very clear by the administration that they only wanted to focus this on CW and not on the, the broader conflict. Uh, so lots of questions now about what U.S. policy is going to be going forward, whether the Geneva process is going to work, and really how we ultimately end up solving the, the civil war in Syria, uh, separate from the ISIS fight, separate from the use of, of chemical weapons. So I will stop there. Okay. <laughs>